welcome to worship. I'm leaving to get my first vaccine today. Welcome to worship. I'm so happy to be fully vaccinated. Good morning. Welcome to worship here on March 14th, 2021 at First Lutheran Church of Columbia Heights, Minnesota. We are a congregation of the ELCA. And at this time we are worshiping physically distant, but still spiritually close, held together by the Holy Spirit. This is the fourth Sunday of Lent. And our theme this Lenten season is questions of Jesus. The questions that Jesus asks us and the questions that we offer to Jesus. This morning, we hear a parable from Jesus about the poor man named Lazarus and a rich man, and asking questions of how do we think about the chasm between those who are selfishly, extremely indulgent and rich, and those who, for whatever reason, have nothing. Our worship today also includes another chapter in our Eyewitness News series drama, and this week we visit with Mary and Martha. We invite you to light a candle to gather wine and grape juice. Amen. the Wednesday, the church began its journey toward baptismal immersion in the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Jesus' disciple Peter, in his letter called 1 Peter, connects the way God saved Noah's family in the flood with the way God saved us through the waters of baptism. The baptismal covenant is made with us individually, but the new life that we are given in baptism is for the sake of the whole world. Online church has made responsive prayers more difficult, but during the season of Lent, we will include the confession and forgiveness of sins. 
Please follow along. As part of this, we invite you to make the sign of the cross on your forehead or upon your chest uh, as part of our beginning and a reminder of the baptismal promise of water on our forehead in baptism. So we do it now. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God, the keeper of the covenant, the source of steadfast love, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. God hears us when we cry and draws us close in Jesus Christ. Let us return to the one who is full of compassion. Please join me. Fountain of living water, pour out your mercy over us. Our sin is heavy and we long to be free. Rebuild what we have ruined and mend what we have torn. Wash us in your cleansing flood. Make us alive in the spirit to follow in the way of Jesus as healers and restorers of the world you so love. Amen. Blessed, God's word never fails. The promise rests on grace by the saving love of Jesus Christ. In the wisdom and power of God, your sins are forgiven and God remembers them no more. Journey in the way of Jesus. Amen. Please join me in a word of prayer. Divine word, you sent Moses to speak to the people and bring order to chaos. You sent prophets to speak repentance and bring hope to the hopeless. You sent your son Jesus to become your living word. Open our ears to hear your word and our hearts to reflect the light of your truth to others for the sake of the incarnate word, Jesus Christ. Amen. This morning, our story time is Rachel James uh, unboxing another item in our Lent at Home bags. This Lent, we are remembering our practices in our Lent in a bag. And today, I want to talk about Jesus being the light of the world. This is something that is so important to remember in these dark, especially winter days when things can just feel so tiring we are beginning to see the sun come up a little bit earlier stay light a little bit longer and we need to remember that as we move forward that we have a light that jesus is a light that shines brightly in our world, in our hearts, in our homes, and in our communities. So as you light this candle, I ask that you think about where you are being called to let your light shine. Is there a place in your family, a relationship, in your community, in your neighborhood, at your workplace? where things have gotten pretty bleak. Maybe things have gotten a little dark. Maybe you found that there's not as much hope in that part of your life as there once was. How can you be a light? How can you invite the light of God to shine through you, to bring hope and joy into that place? Light this candle and take a moment to think to meditate, to pray, and then ask for the bravery to shine brightly in those places that need a little extra light this Lent. This morning we continue the conversation, Eyewitness News, Jerusalem with Dr. Luke, where Dr. Luke uh, talks to Mary and Martha, two sisters with a special story to share with us today.
over the years, many have told and retold the story of the life and times of Jesus of Nazareth, who he was, what he taught, and what it all meant. As a medical professional, I'm here for the facts. And thanks to a grant from the Theophilus Foundation, I was able to interview many of the people who were actually there. Mary and Martha, thank you for making the time to sit down with me. Thank you so much for interviewing us. When we got the invitation, we were so excited. You know how few people care what women actually think. Women should be seen and not heard. But not Jesus. Jesus saw us and heard us loud and clear. Jesus was an unusual rabbi in that he let women join his ministry. That is true. Very true. You would not believe what some of the men would say in the towns we were. They would be shouting, a woman's place is in the home, or some guy was yelling, here comes the unclean parade. Ugh, that one creep shouted so hard he spit in my face. You should be ashamed of yourself. You make me sick. And I didn't hear any of the disciples standing up for us. Not a one. Except for Jesus. Except for Jesus. What would Jesus say when people would criticize you? Well, it depended on who was doing it. Sometimes he would discuss with them how women have always played a huge part in God's work. He would tell them about Sarah and Esther and Rebecca and how the angel appeared to his mother Mary. It was always so sweet to hear him talk about his mom. But if some meathead was trying to harass us, or if they tried to throw things at us, projectile, then Jesus would get angry. Yeah, he would send Peter and Peter would walk right up to him. You know Peter, the fisherman with the big muscles. Yeah, he'd walk right up to him and that would usually shut them up. I keep hearing this story about the time you hosted Jesus at your house. Can you tell me about that night? Okay, okay. That story has gotten blown way out of proportion. Secondly, I would like to go on record by saying that Jesus did not tell us that him and his <clears throat> 12 best friends were coming over for dinner. We didn't have anything prepared. I'm in the living room all night, trying to get everyone settled, getting them a place to sit, just laughing and having a great time with all of our guests. Yep, yeah. and meanwhile, I'm in the back up to my elbows in sheep's meat and pomegranates. I'm trying to butcher and cook the meat as fast as I can. Martha's sheep and pomegranate is delicious. This is 1,300 guys we're talking about. But sheep and pomegranates is a two-person job. So I come out of the living room to ask Mary if she could help squeeze the pomegranate juice. And Jesus shoots her this look. Jesus tells me to stop cooking and to come and hang out with them. I am covered in meat and the whole kitchen is a mess. Hey, I was on your side. You know, we could all smell the deliciousness and we were all getting so hungry. And I get that Jesus hadn't seen us in a long time. And obviously I was excited to see them too. And obviously, I appreciate that he doesn't just assume that we belong in the kitchen. But you know, that sheep and pomegranate isn't gonna cook itself. And seriously. Our reading today is from Luke chapter 16, beginning with verse 19. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen, who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered in sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried. In Hades, where he was being tormented, he looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. 
But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you, send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers, that he may warn them, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. He said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. Here ends our reading. Happy Pi Day! What is Pi Day, you ask? Pi Day is today, March 14th, 314, which happens to coincide with the first three digits of a mathematical constant known by the Greek letter Pi. If you have a math lover in your family, you are probably eating pie today. Pi is a very interesting number. It is well known. It is used in many applications. It is used in air travel, in construction, in medical procedures, in music theory, in quantum physics, and on and on. It is known by the digits 3.14, but it is also very mysterious because it is an irrational number, meaning it can never be reduced to a fraction and nobody knows its exact value. We just can't pin it down because it is a transcendental number, meaning it goes on and on forever, never repeating. So it is known and it is unknowable at the same time. What an interesting number. It sort of reminds me of God, known and unknown. You can't pin God down to an exact value and God goes on forever and ever without repeating, even though we need God every single day. Today, Jesus tells us a parable about two men working out their relationship with God. We have a wealthy man and we have a poor man named Lazarus. Now, it's tempting to take the superficial facts of this parable and think this is a parable about wealth. Or maybe it's a parable about health care. Or maybe it's a parable about social justice. And while all of these themes are part of it, they do not represent the ultimate meaning of this parable, which is developing a relationship with God. So let's look at these two men. We have this wealthy man who has everything he needs in life. He's got plenty of money, plenty of food, lots of great clothes, a great house, a lot in his life that he wants to protect. Versus Lazarus, who is poor, he is sick, he has none of his daily needs, he is desperate for handouts just to survive day to day. Now, between these two men, there is a physical barrier. It is a gate. This gate separates the two men. This gate is not the will of God. It is not the desire of God. It is not the creation of God. Where did this gate come from? The gate was a part of the creation, the will of the wealthy man. Well, why did he put it up? Why does anybody put up a gate? First of all, he probably wanted to protect himself and his possessions. He also wanted to separate himself from those things that he didn't want to deal with. Specifically in this case, Lazarus and all of the issues Lazarus represented. So for its part, the gate was an effective barrier, keeping the two men apart. But there's something even deeper than the gate going on. There is also a spiritual barrier. We get a look at the spiritual barrier when the two men die and go to the afterlife. And we are told that there is a great chasm separating the two men. 
Now, it's tempting to think that this chasm was the will, the creation, the desire of God because it exists in the afterlife. But a careful reading of our parable will reveal to us that this spiritual chasm existed between this wealthy man and Lazarus even on earth. It was not the desire of God. It was not the will of God. It was not the creation of God. This spiritual chasm was the creation of the wealthier man. Because even before he built this gate between himself and Lazarus, he had a spiritual barrier he was building. He didn't want to face Lazarus. He didn't want to face the suffering that Lazarus was experiencing. And he really didn't want to face the role he might be playing in perpetuating this suffering, or at least not relieving the suffering. So even before he put up the gate, he was separating spiritually from Lazarus. And then when they died, we see the spiritual barrier opening up as a chasm between the two men, a symbol that they had space between them. Tragically, this chasm wasn't just between the wealthy man and Lazarus, but also between that wealthy man and God. For in his earthly life, this wealthy man learned to rely on himself, learned to trust in himself to get his needs met. He provided his own food, his own clothes, his own shelter, his own security. And even though he was nominally a child of Abraham, he trusted in himself to take care of himself. As opposed to Lazarus, who had no resources at all and could only trust in God to provide for his needs. So this spiritual chasm was also between the wealthy man and God. And only too late did he realize that he was incapable of crossing this chasm. He couldn't get enough money, enough clothes, enough security, enough gates, enough influence to cross the spiritual barrier to get close to God. As human beings, we are really good at creating barriers. A lot of us have gates, locked doors, barriers around our property. We do this to protect ourselves and our property, just like that wealthy man. But we have to be careful that we are not creating a spiritual chasm at the same time inadvertently separating ourselves from all that lies on the other side of those barriers, the people, the world that exists over there, the suffering that exists perhaps, because you know that where there is suffering, there is God as well. And we do not want to create a barrier so big between ourselves and God that we cannot cross it. Tragically, however, spiritual chasms have been opening up between us and God for our whole lives and even before our whole lives. Sure, we have some problems that we deal with day to day, but there are some problems that are bigger than even us. I'm thinking of a spiritual chasm called racism. Separating ourselves from people that may even be our, our neighbors. I'm thinking about how I learned that the city of Minneapolis is one of the most segregated cities in the United States when you look at who lives where. I'm thinking about a spiritual chasm called poverty, where we do not share enough food with people who are hungry around the world, even though enough food exists for all people to live and thrive. I think about our relationship with this planet that got made, where we will take the resources we need for today, ignoring the wounds that we are creating in this planet that will far outlast our own earthly lives. What do we do in the face of these 
chasms that are separating us from other people, from creation, and most assuredly from God. When we look at these spiritual chasms, we realize that we are a lot like that wealthy man. We are already at the point where we are incapable of crossing them by ourselves. I believe that everybody watching this today would end racism and hunger and pollution today if we could. If as individuals we could put a stop to these evils and cross these chasms, we would. But they are big, they are vast, they are almost incomprehensible. How are we as individuals going to make any difference crossing these chasms? We need a bridge. And thankfully that bridge has come to us and his name, you know, is Jesus. Jesus came to us like that mathematical constant known as pi, both known and unknowable, useful, relatable in our daily lives, fitting into the equations that make our lives work, but also completely vast and unknowable, never repeating, unable to get an exact value, but going on forever. Jesus is human and God at the same time. We can relate to Jesus. We can talk to Jesus about our problems. Jesus can see things with our perspective, but Jesus can also relate us to God. Jesus can bring us a little bit closer across that chasm to God, who is so vast and unknowable that we have no hope of getting there on our own. And while we don't understand how we are going to stop these evils and bridge these chasms, Jesus says, trust me, have faith in me. I will bring you the next step. Have you ever been on a bridge over a very deep hole? It can be terrifying to look down and think, what if I make one misstep? It can be terrifying to trust Jesus as we cross this chasm as well. But Jesus says, keep your eyes on me and I will lead you the next step. So with faith in Jesus, we can step forth courageously facing the things we fear, the things that overwhelm us, the things that we do not understand. With faith in Jesus, we can reach out a hand in friendship to somebody different from us, risking ridicule, risking our friends getting mad at us, risking us getting in trouble. We can do that because we have faith in Jesus. Because we have faith in Jesus, we can take from our own abundance, our own stores and give them to somebody else. Maybe not eliminating hunger globally, but eliminating hunger for one person today getting into their need, taking their suffering on ourselves because we have faith that Jesus will feed us today and tomorrow and for all eternity. Because we have faith in Jesus Christ, we can have the courage to do one new thing that causes us to wonder how everybody else is going to judge us. But one new thing in his name to cross this chasm. We can not only interface with the suffering of another, but even possibly take it on our own shoulders because we are assured that Jesus has an eternity of blessings prepared for us. And it's okay maybe if we suffer on behalf of another today. So as we consider how Jesus is both known and unknowable, both a constant in our daily lives and so vast that our daily lives can't even comprehend him. We see ourselves as a part of God's great, big, divine blessing and plan to cross the chasm, to build relationships with us and between us and all of the rest of creation. So let us take a step forward courageously today 
in the name of Jesus, reaching across a barrier, knocking down a gate, opening up a window, taking a step forward. And maybe we can begin by offering our neighbor a piece of pie. Thank you for celebrating Pie Day with me today. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, today we confess that we like to take your vastness and round it down to a number that we can remember, a number that fits neatly into the equations of our lives, a number that is greatly reduced. And while you are happy to be a part of our lives in any form, Lord, we know that you offer us so much more. Lord, open us up to accept the vastness of your glory and the hugeness of your blessings and give us courage to take a step forward in faith today. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. No one can do like Jesus, not a mumbling word he said. He went walking down to Lazarus' grave and he raised him from the dead. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. When Jesus was on earth, the flesh was very weak. He took a towel and girded himself, and he washed his disciples' feet. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a shelter in the time of storm. Yonder comes my Savior, Him who I love so well. He has the palm of victory and the keys to death and hell. Jesus is a rock in a weary land, a weary land, a weary land. My Jesus is a rock in a weary land. A shelter in the time of storm. A shelter in the time of storm. A shelter in the time of storm. Let us pray. Beloved friends, in this season of repentance and healing, we accept God's invitation to be ever mindful of the needs of others, offering prayers on behalf of God's community in the church and the world. Watch over your church, O God, and lead us to proclaim your love and grace in the world. Keep your church from apathy and judgment and instill in us a sincere desire to care for all people. Watch over creation, O God, and restore all that you have made to wholeness. Work through us to heal waterways of all kinds that all might have clean and abundant water. Work in us and through us to bring healing and wholeness to all that you have made. Watch over our leaders, O God, and set their minds and hearts on justice and peace. Bless all those who speak out on behalf of the poor and the oppressed. Watch over the brokenhearted, O God, and bring them into beloved community. Grant us the eyes to see the hidden pain that others carry and the hearts to reach out to them in love. Watch over the sick, O God. 
plus EMTs, doctors, nurses, therapists, and all who provide comfort and aid to others who are ill in body or mind. Watch over our assembly, O God, and keep us in your care. Bless our ministries to the various generations that it may inspire and equip us for ministry in the world around us. Watch over our community in the midst of the Derek Chauvin trial. We wait and watch, demanding justice and truth, knowing you are with us and will lead us through this time with your hand in ours. Watch over the saints, O God, and keep their memory in our minds. Use us as you have used others to share your love and grace with future generations. Fill us with your strength to resist the seductions of our foolish desires and the tempter's vain delights, that we may walk in obedience and righteousness, rejoicing in you with an upright heart. In Jesus' name, amen. Do you ever feel like this world just doesn't make sense? Or maybe it's your own life that doesn't make sense? We are living in a topsy-turvy world for sure, and we need something to ground us. The only thing that we can truly count on today and for all eternity is Jesus' love for us. When we give generously out of our financial resources, we are testifying to the power of Jesus' love in our lives. We are testifying that we will trust in Jesus above all things, especially earthly resources. Join us in this powerful testimony. You can give financially, electronically, or through paper, but your most important gift is your generous spirit. Thank you. Oh, man, Lazarus, sick and disabled. Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. He had to eat crumbs from the rich man's table. Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame. Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. Rich man dives, he lives so well. Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. And when he died, he went straight to Hades. Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue, cause I'm tormented in the flame. I'm tormented in the flame I'm tormented in the flame Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue Cause I'm tormented in the flame Love to dance, I love to sing Put your finger in the water, come and cool my tongue Cause I'm tormented in the flame I love to praise my Lord and King. Put your finger in the water. Let us pray. Faithful God, you walk beside us in desert places, and you meet us in our hunger with bread from heaven. Accompany us in this meal that we may pass over from death to life with Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. And now we prepare the Lord's table. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again, after supper, he took the cup. He gave thanks, and he gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. And now let us pray with the words our Savior taught us. 
Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Jesus draws the whole world to himself. Come to this meal and be fed. body and blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace now and forever amen let us pray God of steadfast love at this table you gather your people into one body for the sake of the world send us in the power of your spirit that our lives bear witness to the love that has made us new in Jesus Christ our Savior and Lord amen Thank you for joining us for worship today. If this was your first time with us, uh, we welcome you to join us again and are glad that you are with us. A couple of announcements. We continue our series on questions of Jesus. And this coming Wednesday night for our midweek Lenten service, our youth and family intern, Alexis Masson, will be interviewing and having conversation with some of our young people about the questions they ask of Jesus and how they might seek answers. It's good to be with you. Uh, please note that in your email, for those of you who are part of the community, uh, we have decided to have in building worship for Easter, and there are instructions on how to register and uh, questions to be answered about that in your emails. Uh, we will also offer an online service, both available as a DVD and on YouTube, Facebook, and our website on Easter Sunday so that everyone is able to join us to worship the risen Savior. Receive this blessing. You are what God made you to be, created in Christ Jesus for good works, chosen as holy and beloved, freed to serve your neighbor. God bless you, that you may be a blessing in the name of the holy and life-giving Trinity. Amen. Thank you.
Christ Jesus rescues us from death. That is the firmest ground of faith. Be of good cheer for God's own Son, for grants the highest good. All glory to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three in one, to you, O blessed Friends, go in peace and share the good news. Thanks be to God.